Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Please accept my humble obeisances. 
all glories to shila prabhupad i welcome all of you uh, to his holiness chandramouli swami uh, delhi call and uh, guru maharaj is continuing the uh, shrimad bhagavatam canto 10 chapter 10 sorry uh, uh, shrimad bhagavatam uh, canto 10 and chapter 9 and uh, today uh, we will be continuing 10.9.9 so we will continue from that hari krishna dear guru maharaj please accept my humble obeisances all glories to shila prabhupad so guru i am going to share my screen guru maharaj and we will continue from the same 10.9.9 yeah mm -hmm. नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय दिस इज द पास्ट टाइम कृष्णा स्टीलिंग बटर इन द 10th कैंटो 9th चैप्टर शमस्तुरीखम मन When Lord Shri Krishna saw his mother stick in hand, he very quickly got up, got down from the top of the mortar, and began to flee as if very much afraid. Although yogis tried to capture him as Paramatma by meditation, desiring to enter into the abodes of the Lord with great austerities and penance, they failed to reach him. But Mother Yasoda, thinking that that same supreme personality of Godhead. Krishna did begin. Her son began following Krishna to catch him. Her point: Yogis, mystics want to catch Krishna as Paramatma. With great austerity and some penance, they try to approach him, yet they cannot. Here we see, however, that Krishna is going to be caught by Mother Yasoda, and is running away in fear. This illustrates the difference between the bhakta and the yogi. Yogis cannot reach Krishna, but for pure devotees like Mother Yasoda, Krishna is already caught. Krishna was even afraid of Mother Yasoda's stick. This was mentioned by Queen Kunti in her prayers, "By Yam Bhavan Ayam Sitasya." Krishna is afraid of Mother Yasoda, and yogis are afraid of Krishna. Yogis try to reach Krishna by Gyan Yoga and other yogas. But fail. And although Mother Yasoda was a woman, Krishna was afraid of her, as clearly described in this verse. On the ground, to Medandas Yagena Jana Salakaya, Jaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Devi Namaha, Shrima Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Vitale, Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Muti Namine. Namaste, sir. Swat. गौरवृंद Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now this is a very insightful pastime into the nature of the supreme personality of Godhead. Yogis, jnanis, tapasis, and various types of spiritual practitioners. Attempt to approach and even capture the Supreme Lord. 
they all fail. Sometimes they miss one thing, and that is bhakti. Krishna says, bhakti among mava jamati navanyasma Only by devotional service. And then he says again in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, only by undivided devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Krishna remains beyond the reach of the mind, the senses, the intelligence, the, even the imagination. Krishna is Bhaktivat Sao. In other words, he is captured by the love of his devotee. When the devotee has intense loving mood to try to serve Krishna and please Krishna, and in this case, Mother Yasoda, she is the epitome of that loving relationship. Her devotion is even glorified by great personalities like Lord Shiva, Narada, um, Vyasadeva, Lord Brahma. Many of the personalities who are situated on the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion also glorify the uh, nature of this simple lady from Vrindavan. Uh, how much philosophical knowledge she knows, but she has understood the, the goal of all philosophical knowledge, and that is to, to, to worship the Supreme Personality of God in, in devotion. She has attained that state after millions and millions of births, not something that comes easy. Of course, Krishna's mother in the spiritual world is an eternal feature of his his entourage, I mean, she never leaves the spiritual world. She is a Nitya Siddha. But in the material world, that same personality enters into another personality whose name is Dara. Dara and Drona performed great austerities for many, many years to get the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their son. And their, their, uh, their uh, determination was, was uh, successful. Um, that same Dara and Jonah is one of three personalities in the body of Mother Yasoda who comes to the material world, who, who is the expansion of the, the person in the spiritual world, who manifests herself in the material world to assist Krishna in his Boma pastimes, pastimes through the year. But that same mother was so that also has pure love for Krishna. Um, she's not so uh, known for her philosophical uh, erudition, but she is beyond the, the uh, range of all philosophical understanding because she has understood the goal of all philosophy is to serve with love the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So she has reached that stage of perfection. And because of that, uh, she's chasing after Krishna. Krishna's running and Krishna's afraid of the stick of Mother Yasoda. Well, Bhav says here, he's afraid of both Mother Yasoda and her stick. <laughs> And he's running like a frightened child. He's not feigning fear, he is actually fearful. That was his mood in the mood of Vrindavan. He, he, his role in Vrindavan is perfect. It's not an act of devotion. It's not that he has to play the role of being afraid. He is afraid because that is his nature as he adopts his mood of a little child. Who is naughty to his mother? That is Krishna. Krishna is not easy to understand. And no one can catch Krishna. Yogis, mystics, they perform austerities, penances, uh, drill the respiration, and even undergo great sacrifices. But still, as it says here, the yogis cannot reach Krishna. Only devotees. Aruna Kirshchena Padam Padam Padantiyata Yarusman Anandrayaha 
those who climb high on the spiritual path, such as the Brahma bodies, the Maya bodies, not even the Maya bodies, but the impersonalist yogis, because they don't come to the platform of devotion, well, they fall down. Therefore, devotion is what attracts Krishna. And devotion is awakened through the process of bhakti. How does that devotion awaken? Our natural love for Krishna is fixed. It's already there. It doesn't have to be brought in from another place. It doesn't have to be manufactured. And it's not something that we acquire. It is something that we uncover. The soul is covered by the layers of the material energy. This covering is like a cloud over the sun. The sun can never be covered by the cloud, but from a certain angle of vision, it appears in that same way. So actually it appears that the, the soul is actually covered by uh, the body, but the soul can never be covered by the body. But the illusion that the conditioned soul is in is that because of the identi identification with the body, that create, creates this illusion or bodily concept of life. Um, and just like when the cloud covers the sun, if you were in an airplane and you travel above the clouds, the sun is bright. It may be raining on the ground, but above the clouds, the sky is clear and the sun is bright. So when we actually come to devotional service, uh, and then we destroy all the clouds of material coverings. And what are those, what are those coverings? Identification with the body in terms of two coverings, I and mind. <laughs> I and mind are the two, two features of the material coverings. Uh, when we identify ourselves as being a particular gender, particular coming from a particular culture, um, the I concept, I am, and then you can add any kind of words after the words I am, and that is a type of contamination due to the I principle. The law, the mind principle is less powerful, but it also has an effect. The, less, the mind principle is, this is mine, this is my wife, this is my husband, these are my kids, this is my home, this is my computer, this is my car, this is my house. So the, the uh, my conception is not as strong as the I conception, but both of them are illusion because the soul has nothing to do with it. Therefore, the soul is always in love with Krishna. If you sit at Krishna Prema, Saru Kaburoi, so to awaken that love is the process of bhakti. And we're here when we hear about the love of Mother Yasoda. It's just imagine. She's just a apparently a lady from Vrindavan. Um, she is, you know, um, uh, she has many friends. And she's married to the the uh, Prince of Vrindavan, the King of Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj. She's respectable and uh, also glorifiable. But her real glory is that she was able to give birth, at least from the spiritual perspective, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In other words, Krishna chose this great, this soul to be his mother, and he appeared in that way. Um, therefore, um, what is her qualification? Pure love. <laughs> it says that when we, we, when we practice devotional service, we cultivate knowledge. And as we cultivate knowledge, bhakti starts to develop. When bhakti develops even more and more and more, uh, at one point, knowledge even disappears, and bhakti stands supreme, uh, even above all forms of knowledge. So bhakti is that pure love. Love doesn't need to be explained. Love is an experience. 
Love is a natural proclivity of the living entity's ultimate perfection in life. Everyone in this world is, wants to find some kind of loving relationship that they can have. They do it with the opposite sex, either married or unmarried. They uh, do it, there is some loving friendships among people. And people, when they can't love you know, a person, then they get a dog, a cat, or some, some, uh, some, uh, um, hmm. Uh, there was a hamster, and they have a little hamster in the house, and they, they look at the hamster and feel happy. <laughs> so, you know, so the, the, this is like, you know, the propensity to love is, 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 is nature's gift to the soul's existence. And it's actually coming from Krishna himself. Nature is simply providing uh, the opportunity for the soul to enter into the body, but the soul is never, never minimized by the presence of the body, although it appears that way. So here we can learn, as we were reading in the previous verses, one who wants to serve Krishna and offer their love for Krishna in the mood of parental affection, one should study very carefully the mood of uh, devotion uh, as expressed by Prabhu Asura. And that, that study goes on to explain one should observe with bodily features and how those bodily features are being also engaged in Krishna service. She's offering her best milk for Krishna. She's turning the butter and her arms are moving and her hips are shaking. Like that, all of these things are an expression of complete devotion to Krishna. We hear about that in many great souls. Every part of their body is an expression of devotion to the Supreme Lord in service. So here, she's chasing after Krishna. I think if we go to the next verse, it says that when, when she's chasing after Krishna, um, we can go to that tomorrow. You know, it mentions that the flowers in her hair were falling as she was chasing Krishna. And that's a nice explanation. And Krishna is running in fear. And he says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the first chapter, the first chapter, fear personified his fate of, his fate of Krishna. The wind blows out of fear of him. Uh, death takes its toll out of fear of it. Uh, what else did he say? Uh, he speaks of fear of me in different categories. So the, the different features of material nature are in the mood of awe and reverence to the Supreme Personality of God when they obey his command 100%. And so this fear element comes with superiority to inferiority. So Krishna is a supreme a superior person in all respects. And all of nature is working according to his direction. And nature is not static or some important energy. Nature is actually a personality. And she is, we call her Mother Nature, and she is a personification of the external energy of the Lord. She serves the Lord in that way. She is usually categorized as the wife of Lord Shiva, such as Durga, Sachi, uh, Sati, Durga, Uma, Parvati. These are some of the names of the, the features of the external energy. Which are very, very powerful. Tristi, Sisti, Chalaya, Sisti, Sisti, Tristi, Sisti, Palaya, Sadhueta, Chayeva, Vivati, Durga, Chana Rupa, Apa, Yesti, Pesa, Govinda, Mari, Purusham, Tamaham, Vajami. She can create, she can destroy. She is very powerful. 
But she is called Chaya. Chaya means shadow. She works as a shadow reflection of the Lord's desire in this material world. And she was very obedient to the Lord's command. So Krishna is not afraid of anyone. And everyone is afraid of Krishna because he is the supreme personality of Godhead. But when devotion reaches such as a stage of purity, and in this case, he's, uh, he's, he's invoking that mood of being chastised. He's acting like a little kid who doesn't want to listen to his mother. And he doesn't. <laughs> He's God, he's independent, he doesn't, he doesn't need anybody to tell him what to do. But as a three-year-old child, he has to be disciplined. Therefore, his, his mother knows the role she has to play, and she plays it perfectly. So when he does something wrong, she's figuring out how to capture him, bring him back, and maybe also punish him. And that's her duty as a loving mother. And Krishna likes it. Krishna likes it. So these tears, as it says in the previous verse, these were false tears in his eyes because he was being thwarted in his attempt to steal and distribute money. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, for sharing the nectars of this beautiful pastimes. I think more we hear about Krishna, Damoda Leela, more we really relish uh, this particular things, this sweet pastime. Uh, I think, uh, and also when you mentioned about this, uh, uh, like it's like going beyond and top of the cloud, it's completely bright sunshine, uh, which is destroying cloud of material conceptions of like bodily conceptions, my or I. I think it's also very good instructions and learning from this uh, class that we should try to move away and serve Krishna in the pure bhakti, pure devotion rather than dhyana yoga or other yoga. Uh, because that way it's always awe and reverence mode, but uh, bhakti yoga is very, very dear to Krishna. And that's the best way to catch and uh, get hold of Krishna in our heart. So thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Uh, please, if you have any questions, comments, or realizations, uh, you can unmute yourself. Also request everybody, uh, please switch on your video. Nice sunny Sunday morning or afternoon. Or evening. Mm -hmm. And evening also, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's still late afternoon. <laughs> uh, nobody joining from Australia. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. So, I have two hands raised. Great. Yes, Namrata Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to the Holy Maya Buddha. All glories to Damodar Man. All glories to your lotus feet. Uh, Guru Maharaj, my question was regarding Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, when we hear this statement, we have read that Aham Brahmasmi means I am the spirit soul. Uh, so, how do a bhakta understand this statement? How do an impersonal person or a mayavadi understand this statement? <laughs> they don't say aham brahmasmi, they say, they say soham. <laughs> soham, I am that. <laughs> they don't distinguish between they say Brahman is one and therefore the spirit is one. Therefore, uh, there cannot be two spirits. There cannot be the individual spirit and the supreme spirit. In other words, 
They think that all spirit is with one and there is no distinction. They say, Eka Brahma we do not speak. And that Brahman cannot be divided into two. And therefore, it's all one. And because we are Brahman, uh, we are ultimately the Supreme Brahman too. But somehow because of our coming to the material world, we are be performing this Leela of being under the influence of the material energy. It's all a Leela. It's just an illusion. But we are the Supreme. When you are the Supreme, I am the Supreme, Om the Mamarayan. In personalism, my bodies address each other, Om the Mamarayan. So, yeah. So they say, Soham, I am that. What is that? I am that, which is non different from everything else. I am that absolute principle of the spiritual existence. But that is the, our, our philosophy of Chinta Beta Beta Tat, that spirit is both one and different simultaneously. Echo Baha, and then we said, Nityo Nityanam Chaitanya Chaitanya Nam Echo Baha, not Vidadati Prama. The one spirit is maintaining all of the smaller spirits. Nityo Nityanam, Nityanam is us, Nityo is the one, he is Krishna, or he's the Supreme Spirit, and echo the Bahunam with the Dati Tama, no one is equal to or greater than that. So we don't say spirit is divided, but we say that that the, the element of spirit is also simultaneously one and different. And Krishna is the source of everything. And he is the source of our existence too. So we are never separated from Krishna ever. We can never be separated from Krishna. The separation is called a cloud of illusion, which is manifested in the form of this material energy. Material energy is simply a covering over the spiritual energy in a certain part of the spiritual realm. It just takes a small part of that spiritual realm and covers it. And all the souls that enter into that, they're also covered by that same covering. So, yes, I am home Brahmasmi is what I am. We say that, they say so home. They say I am that. They don't make a distinction between between one soul and the other, all souls are one, all souls are the supreme. There is only the supreme. The jiva becomes the jiva only by illusion, but there is no position to the jiva. We say the soul is both finite and infinite, infinite. In its finite realm, it has a tendency to become affected by a stronger energy known as the, the Maya Shakti or the Bahiranga Shakti, which is the material energy. So once we fall out of the spiritual realm, although we're pure spirit, we get covered by an inferior energy called Maya. And then we adopt a particular body and, and then the extensions of the body are the categories of our mind. And that, that that makes up the material tabernacle. So the, the uh, Brahma bodies, or even the Maya bodies, or the personalists, say through penance, through austerity, study of the Vedas, performing sacrifices, and one can enchanting mantras, one can again come back to their pure spiritual essence. But then again, unless they go to a higher state that is serving the Lord in devotion, therefore spirit is one, but uh, what is that verse? Brahmati Paramatma Bhati Bhagavan Eti Subjective. What is the first line? Where's the first line of that verse? Padanti Tat Tat Bhadvidva Tadra Vyanama Vayam 
Namaiti Paramatma Sri Bhagavan Eti Sanjita. This verse says that spirit is one, it cannot be divided, but it is classified in three levels of realization Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So the uh, jnanis, they achieve the Brahman intelligence, the, Parma, the yogis achieve Paramatma, and the devotees achieve Bhagavan, which is the complete manifestation of the Godhead. Lord Krishna is understood in this form as personality. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. In Brahman, there is no personality, it's just this pure spiritual energy. And they want to merge into that spiritual energy and be free from the effects of the material energy and experience the happiness of Brahman realization. But the only problem is that when they could stand the Padam 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 Padam, they fall down again because they don't go to the higher level of serving Krishna and devotion. So, um, therefore, our process is to worship Krishna in devotion. And, and we serve with that supreme personality and devotion. But we also have to understand our position as being a pure spirit self. Having nothing to do with the material energy. So when they so say humble masami, they hardly ever say a humble master. They say so humble. I am that. So Guru Maharaj, if they uh, if they want to merge their identification in the Brahman, uh, so they will lose their uh, they will lose their own identity. So then there's nothing left. Uh, so what I mean. There's nothing to solve there. So that is why they don't feel uh, that satisfaction. Is it right? Yeah, well, if I, uh, if I say, here is, a, here is a beautiful, beautiful land. It's so beautiful. Everything about it is so nice. It is so wonderful. You know, the atmosphere is nice. Everything you need is there to live. But you're the only person there. <laughs> Does that sound enjoyable? You you can have you know every day, but you're all alone. <laughs> so Guru Maharaj, if they if if they um lose their identification, then how do they fall down again if they're losing their own identification? They, 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 fall, down. they fall down because they, have, they, they don't go higher on the, on the spiritual platform. They can't stay in that demonic culture. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no activity there. But as a soul, they still remain even if they are losing the identification? Yeah, still in their spiritual and they're also experiencing the freedom from material suffering, which is a kind of but then okay. again, they come back down because they don't serve you. That, that verse, Aruna Krishna Padam Padam. Look up that verse in the Vrindavana. It's, it's in the 10th canto. Um, that's the Arunya, Aruna. Aruna Twitch Twitch Dana Padam Padam Padanti Ada. It's a very popular verse. It's spoken by Lord Brahma himself. Um, it might be in the, uh, I'm not sure which. Um, Aruna. Uh, let me see if I can. I'll, I'll um, just give me a minute. I'll get my verse. Up. I'll be right back. Sure, sure, good morning.
Srimad Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, Chapter 2, Verse 32, 10 to 32. Yes, Guru Maharaj, go to. Uh, let's see. Ye ne rabin daksa vimukta manina stodas for baba asura buriya. Arunya kuchena padam padam padantiada. Translation. Someone might say, aside from whoever, who always seeks shelter at the Lord's lotus feet, there are those who are not devotees who accept a different process for attaining salvation. What happens to them? In answer to this question, Lord Brahma and the other demigods said, a lotus side note, although non devotees who accept severe austerities and penances to achieve the highest position, they think themselves liberated. Their intelligence is impure. They fall down from their position of imagined superiority because they have no regard for your lotus feet. Someone can read the ver the purport. Uh, uh, read the yes, 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 Shabir Maharaj. Aside from devotees, there are many others non devotees known as karmis, gyanis, or yogis, philanthropists, altruists, politicians, impersonalists, and voidists. There are many varieties of non devotees who have their respective ways of liberation. But simply because they do not know the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet, although they falsely think that they have been liberated and elevated to the highest position, they fall down. As clearly stated by the Lord himself in Bhagavad Gita 9.3. Those who are not faithful on the path of devotional service cannot attain me. O conqueror of foes, but return to birth and death in this material world. If it does not matter whether one is a karmi, jnani, yogi, philanthrop philanthropist, politician, or whatever, if one has no love for the lotus feet of the Lord, one falls down. That is the verdict given by Lord Brahma in this verse. There are persons who advocate accepting any process and who say that whatever process one accept will lead to the same goal, but that is infuted in this verse, where such persons are referred to as vimukta manina, signifying that although they think they have attained the highest perfection, in fact, they have not. In the present day, big, big politicians all over the world think that by scheming, they can occupy the highest political goal post, that of the president or prime minister. But we actually see that even in this life, such big prime ministers, presidents, and other politicians, because of being non-devotees, fall down. To become president or prime minister is not easy. One must work very hard to achieve the post. And even though one may reach his goal, at any moment, one may be kicked down by material nature. In human society, there have been many instances in which great exalted politicians have fallen from government and become lost in historical oblivion. The cause of this age, Abhi Suddha Buddhaya, their intelligence, intelligence is impure. The Shastra says, Nate Bidhu Sortha Gatim Hi Vishnum, Bhagavat, Bhagavatam 7.5.31. One achieves the perfection of life by becoming a devotee of Vishnu. But people do not know this. Therefore, as stated in Bhagavad Gita 12.5, Klesho Dhikatras Tesham Abhyaktaskata Chetasam, persons who do not ultimately accept 
the supreme personality of Godhead and take to devotional service, but who instead are attached to impersonalism and voidism must undergo great labor to achieve their goals. To achieve understanding, such persons work very hard and undergo severe austerities, but their hard labor and austerities themselves are their only achievement, for they do not actually achieve the real goal of life. Dhruv Maharaj at first wanted to achieve the greatest material kingdom and greater material possessions than his father. But when he was actually favored by the Lord, who appeared before him to give him the benedictions he desired, Dhruv Maharaj refused it, saying, Swamin Kratartho Ismi Varam Na Yache. Now I am fully satisfied. I do not want any material benedictions. Hari Bhakti Suddhoya 7.28. This is the perfection of life. Yam Labdhava Chapram Labham Manyate Nadikam Tatha Bhagavad Gita 6.22. If one achieves the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet, one is fully satisfied and does not need to ask for any material benedictions. At night, no one can see a lotus, for lotuses blossom only during the daytime. Therefore, the word Arvindaksha is significant. One who is not captivated by the lotus iris or transcendental form of the Supreme Lord is in darkness, exactly like one who cannot see a lotus. One who has not come to the point of Seeing the lotus eyes and transcendental form of Sham Sundar is a failure. Prema Jana, Shrita Bhakti, Vilochana Santaha, Sadeva Hradeshu, Vilokayanti, those who are attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in love always see the Lord's lotus eyes and lotus feet, whereas other cannot see the Lord's beauty and are therefore classified as Anahadrata, Yushmad, ungrahyash or neglectful of the Lord's personal form. Those who neglect the Lord's form are surely failures on every path in life. But if this is those who neglect the Lord's form are surely failures on every path in life. Continue. But if one develops even a little love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is liberated without difficulty. Solpam api asya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. Therefore, the Supreme Personality of Godhead recommends in Bhagavad Gita 9.34 Man manabhav madbhakto madhyaji ma namaskru. Simply think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer some slight homage to me. Simply by this process, one is guaranteed to return home back to Godhead and thus attain the highest perfection. The Lord further affirms in Bhagavad Gita 18.54 to 55 Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Na Sochati Na Kanchati Somaha Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labate Param Bhaktya Maam Abhijanati Yavan Yas Chashmi Tattutaha Tato Maam Tattato Gyatva Vishate Tad Anantram One who is thus transcendentally situated at once, realizes the Supreme Brahman and become fully joyful. He never laments nor desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. One can understand the Supreme Personality as he is only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness of the Supreme Lord, by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Srila Prabhupada ke jai. So this karpar is done by Srila Prabhupada and he gives an extensive explanation of the verse from different angles of vision, both what is not and what is, just to make a point. This verse is very, this is one of the more fundamental verses in the Bhagavatam, which disposes uh, all ideas that one can attain the Supreme without devotion to the Supreme. 
one has to have devotion to the Lord. Otherwise, all other forms of spiritual life, although very lofty, sometimes very extensively executed, can never bring one to the Supreme Lord. Yogis, Gyanis, Tapasis, various types of uh, spiritualists, although they work very hard, as this verse says, they climb high on the spiritual platform, but then Padantiyada, you fall down again. Why? Right? No devotion to the Lord. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for this elaborated answer. Thank you. I think I, I'll hear this again also. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I can know that this first word is very fundamental to understand how bhakti is superior and uh, it's the only success that you can achieve is bhakti. Temporary success comes by jnana, karma, yoga, and various other things. The temporary is not the nature of the soul's existence. The soul is pure and eternal. Therefore, temporary success will not give satisfaction to the soul, and the soul will lose its the position of temporary success in due course of time. Thanks, Guru Maharaj. Namrata Mataji, I hope this answered your question. Yes, yes, very much. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. God. All the devotees should learn that verse. Guru Maharaj, may I kindly request to lower the screen a little bit, that camera, please. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Perfect. Shidevi Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. This uh, particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, where Krishna says <clears throat> about the impersonalist, he says in the end, at last they achieve me. So does that mean that after repeatedly trying the impersonal path, then finally they come to bhakti. I'm just trying to understand how is Krishna saying that impersonalists also ultimately come to me? Go to chapter 12 in Bhagavad Gita, verse number 5. Verse number 5. That was included in the church book we did tonight. And this is 5.35, yeah? 5.5. 5. 5.5. Five. 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 But the, uh, okay, go to verse three and four first. He quoted three and four. Let's 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 review that one. It's the it's the previous verse. That's why. Yeah. All you had to do was hit the previous verse. Yeah. Okay, so what's the verse? You know, For those who fully worship the unmanifest, that would lie beyond the perception of the all pervading, inconceivable, unchanged, fixed, and immovable. After many births, the man of wisdom seeks refuge in me, knowing that Vasudev is all. When a person comes to full knowledge after many births, he surrenders. And he surrenders unto the Lord. If one approaches the Godhead by the method in this verse, he has to control the senses during the service to everyone engaged in the well being and welfare of all beings. It is inferred that one has to approach Lord Krishna, otherwise, there's no perfect realization. Often, there is much penance involved before one fully surrenders to him. And one to perceive the super soul, one has to see, you know, in the field of activity, hearing, tasting, working. And one comes to understand the super soul is present everywhere. 
So this is the difficult process done by the by the yogi. This is by done by the yogi. And Prabhupada ends, but for the common man, this method of impersonal realization is very difficult. And he explains it in the discussion. Go to the next verse. Well, you have to hit his next. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested and personal features of supreme advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are in body. Read the read the first word. Uh, uh, sure, Guru Maharaj. The group of transcendentalists who follow the path of inconceivable, unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme Lord are called Gyan Yogis. And persons who are in full Krishna consciousness, engaged in devotional service to the Lord, are called Bhakti Yogis. Now, here the difference between Gyan Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is definitely expressed. The process of Gyan Yoga, although ultimately bringing one to the same goal is very troublesome. Whereas the path of Bhakti Yoga, the process of being in direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. The individual soul is embodied since time immemorial. It is very difficult for him to simply theoretically understand that he is not the body. Therefore, the Bhakti Yogi accepts the deity of Krishna as worshipable because there is some bodily conception fixed in the mind which can thus be applied. Of course, worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His form within the temple is not idol worship. There is evidence in the Vedic literature that worship may be saguna or nirguna of the Supreme possessing or not possessing attributes. Worship of the deity in the temple is Saguna worship for the Lord is represented by material qualities, but the form of the Lord, though represented by material qualities such as stone, wood, or oil paint, is not actually material. That is the absolute nature of the Supreme Lord. A crude example may be given here. We may find some mailboxes on the street, and if we post our letters in those boxes, they will naturally go to their destination without difficulty. But any old box or an imitation which may, we may find somewhere, but which is not authorized by the post office will not do the work. Similarly, God has an authorized representation in the deity form, which is called Arch Bigraha. This Archa Bigraha is an incarnation of the Supreme Lord. God will accept serving through that form the Lord is omnipotent, all-powerful. Therefore, by His incarnation as Archa Bigraha, He can accept the services of the devotee, just to make it convenient for the man in conditional life. So, for a devotee, there is no difficulty in approaching the Supreme immediately and directly. But for those who are following the impersonal way to spiritual realization, the path is difficult. They have to understand the unmanifested representation of the Supreme through such Vedic literatures as the Upanishads and they have to learn the language, understand the non-perceptual feelings and realize all these processes. This is not very easy for a common man. A person in Krishna consciousness engaged in devotional service simply by the guidance of the bona fide spiritual master simply by offering regulative obeisances unto the deity, simply by hearing the glories of the Lord, and simply by eating the remnants of the food stuff offered to the Lord, realizes the Supreme Personality of Godhead very easily. There is no doubt that the impersonalists are unnecessarily taking a troublesome path with the risk of not realizing the absolute truth at the ultimate end. But the personalist without any risk, trouble, or difficulty, approaches the Supreme Personality directly. A similar passage appears in Srimad Bhagavatam. It is stated that, that 
if one ultimately has to surrender unto the supreme personality of godhead this surrendering process is called bhakti but instead takes the trouble to understand what is brahman what is not brahman and spend his whole life in this in that way the result is simply troublesome therefore it is advised here that one should not take up this troublesome path of self realization because there is uncertainty in the ultimate result a living entity is eternally an individual soul and if he wants to merge into the spiritual whole he may accomplish the realization of the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of his original nature but the blissful portion is not realized it, by the it, grace he can understand eternal knowledge but the blissful portion is not realized that's a very without that blissful portion one cannot stay fixed in any position anywhere go ahead by the grace of some devotee such as such a transcendentalist highly learned in the process of gyan yoga may come to the point of bhakti yoga or devotional service at that time long practice in impersonalism also becomes a source of trouble because he cannot give up the idea therefore an embodied soul is always in difficulty with the unmanifest both at the time of practice and at the time of realization every living soul is partially independent and one should know for certain that this unmanifested realization is against the nature of his spiritual blissful self one should not take up this process for every individual living entity the process of krishna consciousness which entails full engagement in devotional service is the best way if one wants to ignore this devotional service there is a danger of turning to atheism thus the process of centering attention on the unmanifested the inconceivable which is beyond the approach of the senses as already expressed in this verse should never be encouraged at any time especially in this age it is not advised by lord krishna shila prabhupad ki jai so what do you think uh, shila do you want to try sorry maharaj i didn't catch that could you repeat <clears throat> you want to try the impersonal path no i'm just asking how krishna says in the end they attain me so i i was wondering how on this difficult path how do they ultimately come to krishna and here in this purport shila prabhupad explains it's only by the grace of a devotee that they may come to the point of bhakti yoga yeah and the the impersonal path is they undergo much difficulty both during the process and even after they achieve the path which is very rarely done in this age so it's not that the process is not authorized it's just not recommended at all so guru maharaj just as a follow up question in this day and age where any kind of tapasya is difficult how is it that these people choose this path of impersonal realization why is mayavadi um, why are so many mayavadis around if this is such a troublesome such a difficult path is it because of ignorance of bhakti that they just take up this path or why is it that they take up this troublesome path It's because of the, the the original sin, which is causes the living entity to fall to the material world, and that is called envy. They're envious of the supreme world. They don't want to serve the world. Mostly, everyone is envious of God because either they want to be God, or God is interfering with their their plans for happiness in this material world. 
So they find different ways to push out God or to ignore God or to minimize his position. And therefore, they pick up these other paths. These other paths are authorized, but not in this age. I mean, you had some great tapasis in previous ages who were successful in these, these, other, these other programs. Uh, you had, uh, I think, Nim Vishwamita Muni. And then you had others who are uh, great, great, powerful yogis. And you know, with, with Kali Yuga, people don't have those, those Shakti anymore. Papa said the yogis can, they can focus their consciousness and the time of death, they can even choose the time of death and then they can focus where they want to go. They can elevate themselves to any planet in the material world. And if they're pure yogis, they can enter into the spiritual world. So this Astanga Yoga process, Krishna also speaks about that in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Although he speaks about it in detail, again, as Prabhupada does with this particular section in the Gita, he says it's not recommended. The direct process is easy and guaranteed. Because one of the factors of the direct process is that the Lord gets helped by Krishna. Whereas these other processes, the Lord doesn't help them because they want to do it on their own. Or chant, Hare Krishna, dance, take prasadam, and worship the Lord in his deity form. And the whole process of bhakti is summed up, summed up by Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, Mana Bhava Madhva, Kil Mam Yati Mam Dhamma Guru, 1865. Prabhupada said this, these four items always think of me, come my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage to me. This comprises all the activities of Bhakti. So, therefore, until they also come to Bhakti, they cannot attain Krishna. Not in this age. Yes. That's what it says. That's what Prabhupada said. He, he, did, he said the process is authorized, but it's so difficult and impossible in this age. So then best is to directly take to Bhakti Yoga instead of this troublesome method. Yeah. If you read Radha Swami's account of the journey home, he met many powerful yogis when he was in when you think it's in our own age. I mean, they can do many mystical things. We came across the Shivites, the Shivites. They can, they can, they can elevate themselves and they can sit in, mid, in midair in lotus position. They're floating above the ground. But that's just some kind of mystic power. You have to understand the soul can never be fully satisfied unless it develops love for Krishna. Love is the nature of the soul's existence. Not power, not knowledge. So Shidhavi Mataji, does it answer us? Yes, very, very thankful for Guru Maharaj's complete explanation and also thankful to Namrata because this was a question that had been troubling me for some time. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, process is already authorized for that, but it's very troublesome and no one can do it. Namta Mataji, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. 
and there may be a few yogis who can do it. They don't oh. they don't associate with people. They're in they're in the jungle. Uh, Guru Maharaj, is it okay? Uh, it's 10 minutes past. So, um, is it okay or should I keep my question for tomorrow? Is it okay, Guru Maharaj, to ask one more question or uh, should I keep my question for tomorrow? What do you think, it's 10 minutes past Guru Maharaj. Maybe we can take this if it's okay with you. Just one as a last question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Namtha please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Guru Maharaj, just the continuity. Uh, I think this is kind of questioning the authority, but uh, I would just like to understand this for my clarification. So uh, because of the unnecessary sacrificial practices, the incarnation of Buddha appeared. Uh, then, if the uh, if he stopped the uh, unnecessary uh, sacrifices, then the Sankracharya uh, put forth the Advaita philosophy. So I was just wondering why was the need of Advaita philosophy if the personal form is the only ultimate, uh, I mean, the Advaita philosophy is ultimately should be reachable, right? So why was... Yeah, Buddha, Buddha is Gnostic. Gnostic means atheist. He's Gnostic. Buddha. Although Buddha is Krishna, he, he, still, he, thinks, he thinks there is no God. Although he's God, he thinks it's a ghost. His whole idea was to get people off, off the Vedas. And but and so he got people off the Vedas because they were misusing the Vedas to kill animals. So to show compassion to the animals, Buddha appeared. So, but now people were Gnostic atheists. So, Sankaracharya, who was Lord Shiva, who was a great devotee, came to put people back on the Vedas, but in a, in a monistic way. And after he established monism, then uh, Nanamitacharya came with the Vashishta Dvaita, um, what he's called. You know, Undifferentiated dualism, the differentiated dualism, Vashishta Dvaita, and then uh, Madhvacharya took a little higher, became Dvaita Dvaita, and then Lord Chaitanya brought the whole process back to the perfection of Asinka Veda Veda Tattva. So if you study the history, you'll see it. all of these is the plan of the Lord. Okay, thank you so much. I think the for at least now when we go to the holy places, we see that uh, the Advait followers are so much that they they really uh, stop themselves to reach the uh, you know personal philosophy and. There, like, there are too much around us. So, especially, I find this in India. You think there's too many impersonalists? Too many. Still, the Advait followers are still so much in India that it is like difficult to, uh, you know, make them understand or uh, preach them about the personal philosophy. Yeah, yeah, just beat them with shoes. Take your shoes and just beat them on the head. 
That's the best way to preach to them. <laughs> Sorry, Guru Maharaj, can you just repeat the last statement you made again? <laughs> no, I won't. The last repeat. statement. <laughs> the point is. Uh, Yeah, people don't want to surrender to God. That's the whole reason. That's why the impersonalist the people take up impersonalism. In the Western world, people are impersonalist without understanding impersonalism. So don't become discouraged. It's, there's so many impersonalists. They're everywhere. There's Maya bodies, there's impersonalists, various types of yoga. They're everywhere. Sankaracharya. Okay. Yeah, Sankar, in, especially in South India, they're very strong yet. But, you know, therefore, the Madhvachar, the Madhvats, they're always, they're always debating and defeating the impersonal. Study the life of Madhvacharya. He debated them. Ramanujacharya, he, he debated the impersonal. He defeated them. And there are many other great personalities. Even in our present ISKCON society, you know, Shiva Ram Maharaj defeated an impersonalist. You know, they're everywhere. You know? Most of us are impersonalists. Well, not in a philosophical way, just we, we have to understand that everything is personal. Everything is the energy of Krishna, or anything, everything is Krishna, or Krishna's energy, therefore everything is personal because it's all connected to Krishna. The personalists come up with their theories just so they don't have to surrender. I've been around many impersonalists. I even, even went to their conferences. I spoke at their conferences also. They're miserable. They never, you can see they're never happy. Devotees are happy. <laughs> Personally, they look they look morose because all they do is they all they do is perform austerity and study scripture. Right? That'll make you miserable. We chant, dance, and take prasad. We're happy. Thank you, Guru they done your chant, dance, and pick for shot. He's God. He's God. Yes. Thank you, thank you, very much. I think you're going to be personally. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, I'm not actually Guru Maharaj, but yes, I have been uh, uh, hearing some of the philosophies because around me from the childhood, the, there were mixed devotees. Uh, we do have the personal uh, worship, but... Uh, there are concocted uh, theories. There were concocted theories around me. So that kept me thinking always. But then 
when I, uh, when I, yes, your mother was yes. a devotee. Your mother was a bhakti, bhakti, right? Your mother was a bhakti, she was into bhakti yoga, right? Your mother? Yes, Guru Maharaj. They, uh, yeah, she definitely was uh, inclined towards uh, Krishna Bhakti. In fact, in my families are, uh, in my family, they are. But discussing the philosophies they do involve the impersonal philosophies also. So, you know, the things keep churning in the mind. And then my, uh, my satisfaction finally landed on uh, uh, Prabhupada philosophy, which I found was the easiest and uh, it was like a spoon feeding in, in this uh, era, which nobody has done. So, but when you realize it, it is very difficult to make others understand who has already, uh, you know, churning in this uh, mixed impersonal and personal philosophies. Yeah. So. But our philosophy says, can't smoke cigarettes, can't drink tea, can't, you can't have illicit sex, you can't have intoxication, you can't gamble, all of these things. And then when they hear that, they run. <laughs> so that's the difficulty of our practice. And Prabhupada was talking today. And they were he was they were referring to one man that Prabhupada met earlier. He was he wanted to discuss. Prabhupada was talking about uh, the four regulative principles. He was talking about no meat eating. And the man said, well, let's talk about higher, higher philosophical points. Prabhupada said, how? If you don't know ABC, how are you going to know, you know, X, Y, Z? So before you can actually understand higher knowledge, you have to follow those four regulatory principles. There's where, our, there's where people run from our philosophy. Although the philosophy and, and practice is really nice, that section of the four regs, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. Prabhupada talks about, you know, one of his god brothers was preaching in London. And he asked that, he asked, uh, he met one Lord, Lord Zetman. And the Lord's said to Prabhupada's government, can you make me a Brahmana? He said, yes, we can make you a Brahmana. Well, what do I have to do? And he named the four regs. He said, these are impossible. This is our life. But people can't follow that. Even devotees fall down from that. But that's the requirement in order to understand to honor, to chant, dance, and take prasadam in a very happy way. You have to be free from the tendency to commit sinful activity. That's the prerequisite. That's the foundation. So there's where our process becomes apparently difficult for people to accept. Process is nice. Sing, dance, make, eat nice food, associate with nice people, read books, worship the Lord in the temple. Very nice, easy, pay your basis, no problem. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, no onions, no garlic, no tea, no caffeine. Hey. And then we see the numbers go down. <laughs> but these are preliminary. No chocolate. Well, chocolate has been authorized now. But chocolate, chocolate is, is not a very clean food. Chocolate is also known as an aphrodisiac. So just like Prabhupada talks about tamarind. Tamarind is a food that we can eat. But Prabhupada said if we eat tamarind, we can also, the senses become so strong we can't practice Krishna consciousness. 
just like he said, no, uh, no masorda. You can take erdal, you can take Savadal, you can take mangdal. He said, no, no masorda. Masordal is, is like lentils, very high in protein. So high high protein foods are also considered to be non veg. <laughs> so when you know we say chant dance, take prashad and have fun, yeah, but then when they get in and they we say, know this, know that, know this, <laughs> they say, Swamiji, we'll see you around Dubai. <laughs> I gotta have my cigarette. Prabhupada said in India, India they know Krishna, but they can't they can't stop chewing betel or chupan. Last night I was at the temple and uh, I saw one man whose teeth were all red. I can't give it up. Chewing pond, it's an intoxicant. Betel. Doing uh, and then uh, you know beating cigarettes. Okay. There's where people back off because they can't do that. And even our devotees, when they even went to get initiated, they fall down because they don't follow this principle. Yes, Guru Maharaj, very true. Uh, in India, people, due to the pious nature, they do uh, follow the personal uh, form of Krishna, but uh, uh, this austerities, they are reluctant for this austerities. They're not, they're, that doesn't uh, easily... Uh, uh, they they cannot take up this easily in mind. Why to leave all these things? Yeah. But if they associate with devotees and chant the holy names gradually, they become qualified. And then yeah. the devotee, after a devotee is practicing for a while, he thinks, oh, yeah, meat eating, yeah, illicit sex, intoxication, yeah, gambling, yeah. Who wants it? Disgusting. Horrible. But that's a higher taste. If you want to get the higher taste, you have to sacrifice something on the lower level and you get the higher taste. If you want to graduate from college, you have to stop going to parties and spend time studying your lessons. So there, there is some sacrifice, but that sacrifice doesn't, it turns into something, un, uh, something really natural after a while. You, know, you don't even look, you think all of these things are just bleh, a waste of time. And they're all bad for your health, all of them. Gambling creates such a such a small mindedness. People become so self centered. Illicit sex it weakens the body, it decreases the duration of life, causes impotency towards the later age. It makes one stupid. Intoxication. Everybody's intoxicated. They have to, they drink all this thing, they can't think straight. And then they say things and do things that they don't really want to do or say. And meat eating, you're, you're getting heavy karma, you're killing an animal. You say, well, I'm not killing an animal, but the animal's being killed so you can eat the meat. So you're also part of that karma. So if you see all of the, uh, all of the negativity attached to these four regulative principles, you'll stop. Why should I do that? It's just hurting my mentally, spiritually, physically, everything. 
Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Unless we practice all these things, we don't realize it. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, we have to understand that there, the higher taste is there. The Sayan Vini Bartan Te Nivarasya Dehinam Maso Vyajam Maso Krasya Param Driswa Nivarasan Te Param Driswa Supreme taste, the sweet taste. Bhakti is sweet. Not just rules and regulations, it is. So sweet can't be beat. Is never under defeat. It brings you to Krishna's lotus feet. <laughs> it's the ultimate treat. <laughs> It's very, it's very neat. <laughs> it's the highest feat. <laughs> yeah, so. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this uh, inspiring instant poem. Yeah. Keep painting for Krishna, you'll go back to God, no question about it. Namta Mataji, I hope this answered your question. Yes, thank you. And sorry, Shidevi Mataji and Scarlett Mataji, I, if you don't mind, because it's already half past, like 32 minutes over. Uh, just like, uh, maybe if we can take these questions tomorrow, is that okay? Shidevi Mataji, Scarlett Mataji, if you don't mind, please. Unless you have any specific, very uh, small subtle point to mention here, something related to this. <laughs> okay, I still see Hendrej Shidevi Mataji. So you want to, you have something very brief you want to mention? Okay. Oh, yeah, so, I can just quickly mention since please, you say, please, please. I was in a place where young boys are being trained in impersonal chanting of different mantras and everything. And poor boys, they were sitting there and for hours they would chant, chant, chant these mantras. And the Gurukul teachers would be walking up and down, making sure they're chanting their mantras. And finally, when it was all over, they would run out, they would see me. And with a big smile, they would say, Hare Krishna. And I gave them Krishna Prashadam. I showed them the Murti of Udupi Sri Krishna. And in the end, when I was leaving, they all told me they're going to miss me. The only thing I did, because I know how those people are, I would see every one of those boys and I would smile and say Hare Krishna. That's all I did because I knew that they don't like us. So, but the boys, they could see that he was a person who is practicing Krishna consciousness and they felt joyful simply saying Hare Krishna back to me. Every time they saw me, they would smile and they would say Hare Krishna. And they became joyful simply by that. And they told me they're going to miss me because I was leaving. So Bhakti is very powerful. I can see that. Thank you, Mataji. <laughs> this beautiful. I thought you will be saying Gauranga as per Janki Nath Prabhu rather than Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 Gauranga, Jai. Very good. So thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your association and for long session today. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I still would like myself to go back to that same mood of uh, little Krishna running behind 
and uh, in the fear state, fearful state, when Mother Yashoda is running behind him, <laughs> I would like to meditate rather than going on that heavy philosophical subjects, at least for today. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Didi will jump off the altar and then you'll have to chase him around the house. <laughs> I think he does that to your wife, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your deities are very, very powerful. Very powerful. And your wife talks to them and they tell her what, to, what they want to dress in, right? She tells me. <laughs> and she, she's a, your wife is like on a different level. <laughs> she's like way up there. <laughs> Yes, Guru Maharaj, I'm not at that level, so <laughs> I'm still behind that uh, meditation mood of little Krishna. <laughs> Mother Yashoda is running, rather than Krishna is running behind devotee. <laughs> so, the only thing I'm with you, you are doing kirtan in the most exemplary way. And everybody around you, they have no choice. They have to jump in the kirtan. <laughs> Yeah, All your mercy, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for your blessings and mercy. I remember when we were on that, uh, that uh, walk, I forgot, the, um, September 24th, it was like a walk for food for all. Yes. And then Everybody was leaning, and then everyone says, well, who can lead now? Nobody wanted to lead. And then you said, I'll lead. <laughs> and then when you led, then I started dancing. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. I didn't want to leave that opportunity, especially for Harinam. Like, why to? So that's a rare and good opportunity. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. That was nice. Jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Anant Koti Vaishnava Brind ki jai. Hari Hari Bol. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for today. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.